Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We're here with uh, another episode. And, um, you know, I think that's uh, that kind of obvious, actually. I <laughs> say that most of the time in the opening, like, hey, we're here with another episode. But, I mean, here I am talking and if you're watching this or listening to this. Uh, kind of obvious I'm here with another episode. But, anyway, just thought I'd, uh, thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> Not saying I'm going to change or stop saying that, but um, it is kind of obvious, I guess. Uh, so I wanted to uh, wanted to go to a passage of scripture here, talk a little bit about something. Um, I heard on a podcast recently a uh, a professor um, was was uh, given an interview about I think it was from ASU uh, out in Arizona, and um, he was one of like three professors that stood up to like thirty seven other professors. To allow some people on campus that had some um, some right leaning conservative viewpoints on things, you know, uh, they dared to say such and just crazy unscientific things like there's only two genders and stuff like that. And um, these these professors, like the students, were all into it. Apparently, they were all loving it. The whole point of the talk uh, was not even about any of that stuff. It was about um, prosperity, like health, wealth, trying to help people flourish and prosper and stuff. And it just so happened that these professors didn't like who the speakers were. Uh, I heard this. It was This was all in a recent episode of um, Rich Dad uh, Radio, which is uh, Robert Kiyosaki's podcast. But anyway, uh, the, the whole podcast, thing was the, the students were having a great time they're ready to, they're ready to rock and roll and then uh in comes the the 37 professors who signed on to some thingamajig and uh you know petitioned the college like hey we don't think these people should be here you know hate speech blah 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 and um only like one of three professors came came to their def came to the speaker's defense like Robert Kiyosaki and um there were several other people there that were going to be speaking at this thing Charlie Kirk I think was one of them uh Dennis Prager was another one and again they have uh what today are controversial views but but I mean a hundred years ago when people had a little more sense or a lot more sense um these were completely not controversial views at all uh, but even if even if somebody has co controversial views, legitimate controversial views, um, I mean, when you think about like when you think about learning, you're at a university, right? What happened to free speech? <laughs> what, people are having a, a an event. Speakers are coming in to talk to some of the students and stuff, and we like literally cannot listen to we can't hear uh viewpoints we literally cannot i mean fingers in the ears la 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 like we we will not hear these viewpoints what kind of a college professor is that that would be like no we can't have this uh well i know right it's a rhetorical question it's one with no spine a squish uh, probably on the leftward leaning uh, side of things because that tends to be where all of the uh, destruction of the freedom of speech and freedom of everything happens to be at this point in this country. Now, again, I'm not saying it couldn't go the other way and you have some, you know, hardcore, you know, right wing, super conservative. We can't let any kind of dissension, you know, dis dissent or dissenting voice speak, but that's not what's happening right now. So, we can talk hypotheticals and, and theory all day long, or we can just talk to what actually is happening in our country currently. Um, you know, socialist communists, you know, ridiculous uh, crazies are trying to clamp down and stop people from literally even having a point of view that is spoken. Instead of, like, if a point of view is so evil, terrible, you know, illogical, um, just easy to smash down, just, it's fake news, it's fake news, you know, <laughs> you know, shouldn't, shouldn't it be easy to get into a public forum and like, hey, let's debate, 
hey, we'd like to invite you know a couple of our folks over and and, and hash this out and uh, show all the students how that um, our ways, what we believe, is so superior to what you believe. Um, it, it should be pretty easy to do, or at least have the valid the, the two arguments, and then what's your best case, what's my best case, and then the student should be able to see if there's a clear best case. Shouldn't be that difficult for you to see that, especially when those students are then going to turn around and go to your classroom and hear you in class for another semester, while these people are going to go away and you know maybe they, they won't ever hear them again unless they you know buy their book or subscribe to their podcast or something. You know how horrible that would be to have other opinions out there. But anyway, so the the teacher, oh man, I cannot remember the teacher's name. I think his name was Owen Anderson. Um, don't quote me on that. Uh, I have his, I have one of his books actually uh, in my in my cart on Amazon because I heard that uh, while he was talking, he has a couple of books. One of them's on like philosophy and stuff. He's a teacher of like religious studies and philosophy and stuff at uh, ASU. And I was like, oh man, this is cool. I you know love to. He, and he's a Christian, so coming from a Christian perspective, throwing in some philosophy. I love philosophy. I love. I, I personally think the philosophical way of doing things, just the you know philosophical mind is kind of the, the the greatest you know intellectual mind because it's one that really tries to um, think deeply about things research things live in reality and, and again I'm, I'm talking I guess a specific kind of philosophy I guess there's philosophers that are you know just nihilistic and uh, just you know whatever deterministic and, and I guess there's atheist philosophers but at least a, a true atheist philosopher, I would think, is open to debate, open to hearing the other side, open to presenting the other side, open to debating, and that kind of, I already said debating. But anyway, so during the conversation, uh, they talked about something that I believe is going on uh, and has been going on for, for a long time now. And I think it contributes to a lot of the reason why we see such horrible, moral decay, cultural decay in our uh, in our world right now. And I, I say our world, if you're living in some part of the world where this isn't happening, God bless you. That's great. Keep that up. But I mean, definitely in the United States of America, you, you see it all across Europe when when we had all of the, uh, you know, what did, they, what did I hear the other day? The Fauci ouchie. Um, thought that was pretty funny. But, you know, all, when all that stuff happened, you have these places like uh, Australia and like Canada behaving. I mean, I, I really think they would have got a standing ovation from people like Stalin. Like, yes, that's my boys um, and girls. But seriously, just it's awful. So how do we get here? What is going on? I mean, some of these countries supposedly are like Christian origin, Christ, Christian countries, I think a lot of people would still say, oh, America's a Christian nation. You know, they might say it, you know, whisperingly uh, after they put their cell phone and, you know, drop it into a, uh, a glass of iced tea or something. Say it, you know, in hushed tones in the back of a, a dim lit, you know. I almost said saloon, but why would two Christians be hanging out in saloon? <laughs> you know, a dim lit restaurant or something. And, and I think, and, and it act that, that whole scenario right, that I just came up with in my mind, like thinking two people like, you know, hunched over cell phones over here, just like hanging out like a glass of iced tea and just like, Hey, it's a Christian nation still. Right. Oh, here comes somebody. Shh. That right there is what I'm talking about. And what they talked about, it actually has a name. It's called the chilling effect. And, uh, the, I'm going to call him Owen. I think it was Owen Anderson. But uh, anyway, he he said that he sees this a lot on campus, and, and it's, a, it's kind of a big thing where in, in his personal kind of anecdotal you know view of things, and then, of course, the Supreme Court has addressed this kind of thing because it suppresses. It's, it's something that suppresses free speech, but it's done by self-censorship. It's done when people, like, self-censor. So if there's nobody specifically like threatening you and then you you know you be quiet because they said I'm going to you know I'm going to bash your teeth in if you say that or anything like that. But what it is is it's a oh oh you know what just just came to my mind in um in the business world 
uh, like an HR or something like that, they talk about having a place, you know, there's uh, different things that are that are like harassment and stuff, right? One of them is called quid, quid pro quo, like I do for you, you do for me type of thing. You know, give you, hey, you know, uh, you, you be my little girl on the side or my guy on the side or whatever, and I will, uh, you know, give you a promotion. That's quid pro quo. But they have another one called hostile environment. And that's where there's no specific, like, said, if you do this, I'll do this, that kind of thing. But the whole, just the environment as a total picture is hostile in that way. And that is a perfect, again, analogy of this whole, uh, the chilling effect where the environment of a place, it could be a nation, it could be a school, it could be, you know, your, your workplace, you don't want to speak out on certain viewpoints and opinions uh, because you're afraid of potential ramifications. And so you self-censor. You censor yourself. You don't speak out. You don't say things. And uh, I, th I truly believe that some of, some of this um, contributes to the, the problems that we see in society today. Christians, instead of speaking out, uh, self-censor. Now, we could talk about maybe a few reasons that they might self-censor. Um, one, we'll get to the last one, right, where, where it's kind of a hostile environment. We'll get there last. But let's think of some reasons other than that. Christians, I think, sometimes will self-censor out of they don't want to offend someone. They don't want to be offensive, right? They want to be everybody's bestie. They want to be best friends with everybody. We're gonna we're gonna win people to Christ by um, not actually teaching why Jesus Christ was even necessary. Why was the cross even necessary? Let's not talk about that. Let's just talk about he's your best buddy. Jesus is your friend. Jesus is your cool, you know, your your cool bro. Um, or he's just desperately in love with you and just like, you know, just sending out uh, love waves into the atmosphere trying to reach you. He's going to help you live your best life, like all this stuff. Um, so they, they censor themselves because they, they don't want to come across uh, in an offensive way or hurt somebody's feelings. Or maybe, you know, some people I think do that because they might lose money. Well, no, not they might. They would. They would lose money. They would lose, you know, some of these massive, not even just massive. I, I don't want to pick on just the massive guys that everybody knows about, like the massive churches that are, you know, that they don't teach on sin. It's, it's basically just like new agey Christianity. Um, but there's li there's little churches, twenty people, fifty people, a hundred people, um, that this is their whole like they want to grow and all that, and that and they don't want to address real problems, issues, sin, when you come to Christ, like, hey, he's Lord now, you're supposed to obey him, there's some things you should be not doing, there's some things you should be doing, um, all that. So that's one reason why I can see people might self-censor. Um, another reason for self-censoring might be this whole uh, eschatological viewpoint, right? The, your eschatology, when you believe that Satan is the like the undisputed god of this world, um, and that Christians are really just a uh, we're kind of an anomaly. We're kind of the Bible. I mean, we're we are in the world, not of the world. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we are doomed to failure until Jesus rescues us out of here. That just means we don't take on the ideology and the mindsets of this world, rather we bring the light of the gospel and, and change the world around us by uh, bringing the kingdom of God. But if you are the kind of person that could just kind of thinks, you know, kind of that defeatist, uh, where God's going to rapture us out of here, you know, funny all these guys, like, so so a lot of the people, uh, was it Hal Lindsey with the um, late great, Planet Earth and like the Left Behind series, which, and you know, entertaining books and maybe there's some stuff in there that's true, but it's like, a lot of it's just like, really, I, I, that's a stretch to try and fit that in the Bible. But a lot of people believe it, 
And you can't tell me, I, I challenge somebody, I challenge anybody. You tell me, you can tell me theoretically that if you believe it's all going to hell in a handbasket and Jesus is going to rescue us out of here in the rapture type of thing, you can try to make a case that that's not going to translate into sort of a we're off hiding in a cave mentality, trying to reach people, bring them in the cave with us. You can make a case that that's not going to happen. No, no, no. We're, we're still going to go out and evangelize the world and break, be kingdom and sh spread the light. And, you know, but in reality, that's not what's happening. Uh, that's not what's going to happen. Be honest about it. Look at your local church. That's not what's happening. Um, generally, when you when you see this kind of that kind of thought process, and that's what's taught, and it's not what's happened in general in the United States and in Western culture that have bought into a lot of this stuff. Um, that's not what's happened. What's happened is the church has separated. The church has kind of gone off on their own little island and just like waiting for Jesus to come rescue us. So. There's a self-censorship. You just don't think it's worth it, or hey, you know what? This this whole thing is gonna get rolled up, passed up in you know 20 years, 40 years. But you know, again, the, the Hal Lindsey stuff, the um anyway, I don't want to again, the point is not to call out people on their eschatology. The point is, you know, it, they had this whole thing with 1948. Uh, Israel becomes a nation, this generation shall not pass, a generation is 40 years, so within like you know, by the night by 1990, at least, depending on how you add subtract, you know, the tribulation and all this stuff. Like 1948, right? 40 years later is basically 1988. Remember the remember the book, 88 Reasons Why God's Coming Back in 88, and then that was a false prophecy, failed prediction. And then another book comes out like 89, like, hey, I missed it last time. It's here in 89, like, <laughs> and it actually sold like some copies. Like it should have sold zero copies. Like. Zero. <laughs> but people people buy into fear. People actually buy into, oh my gosh, what's coming next? <laughs> Just look at the news, right? Everything's great today. Everything's going awesome, right? Uh, firefighters are out doing nothing but rescuing cats out of trees. Nobody's going to tune in. World's falling apart. Tune in now to find out what you can do and what's happening. Everybody's going to watch, right? So it's the same kind of thing in, in in human nature, whatever it is about us, we just kind of, you know, that we gravitate toward that a lot of times. So anyway, so there's two right there. One, you don't you don't want to come across as mean or whatever, or two, your your eschatology just basically, you know, is is telling you why speak up, why speak out, you know. And then the third, of course, is is I think probably the biggest one right now. And has been for a few decades, and that is that um, uh, people have a fear of you know the culture, uh, what people are going to think of them, what they'll say, you know, job on the line, uh, uh, people you know shunning, being nasty to them, whatever, uh, calling them names, you misogynist, you racist, you bigot, um, <laughs> which again. They're gonna they're gonna call you that anyway. I don't. <laughs> I I I honestly I I think I can sympathize a little bit with people in that boat. I probably could even if I really try like empathize with them, like try to get in there on their level and just kind of be like, listen, I feel I get what you're what you're saying. Um, but I just don't have that. Like if somebody calls me names, like whatever. <laughs> you know, again, I'm. Do a self check. Be like, you know, I mean, man, am, am I coming? Am I that way? Am I coming across that way? And again, maybe it's because I've been pastoring long enough that, I mean, you just get that, right? People, you get up, you pe you tr you peach a trashinate, <laughs> you preach a passionate message. There we go. I'm trying to get my words out. You preach a a passionate a passionate message. Um, you're teaching, you know, it's you're trying to bring people out of sin. You're calling out stuff in the culture and the world and saying, listen, this is wrong. Uh, we need to we need to be get off of that stuff. We need to be real uh, disciples of Christ and make him Lord and change some stuff and clean some stuff up and not develop the mindsets. You'd be surprised how many people are just like, oh, you either A, they don't like it because, you know, they're 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 A, you know, A, they're backslidden, B. 
they don't want to hear it because they they're enjoying their sin. They don't want to you know actually come and be a disciple. Um, C. There are people that believe what you're saying, but they don't. They're the chilling effect, right? They they don't want to say it. They're uncomfortable, uh, and they they believe what you're saying. They're on they're on one hundred percent, but they don't think you should say it. You know, it's like or or you shouldn't say it with any kind of passion, with any kind of like you actually care about people, you care about the kingdom of God. You should just like speak in monotone, like soft. I don't know. I don't know. I don't do that. I don't do monotone, soft, wimpy. Uh, I don't think Christianity. Christianity was born in fire, folks. Um, the the in the book of Acts, they, other people said this. Now, people will say this on their website, on their blog, on an opening like video reel. We're changing the world. We're turning the world upside down. In the book of Acts, the enemies of the church, people who didn't like them, were saying these people are changing the world. They're ta- they're, they're turning the world upside down. Um, but wherever they went, a you know, long time ago, I heard a guy say, everywhere they went, there was either revival or there was a riot. That was it. I mean, there wasn't like an in-between. People loved it. Come on, let's bring this in. Or people were throwing them out of the city, stoning them, throwing them, throwing them in prison. I mean, who's going to throw somebody in prison for just being, you know, wishy-washy, no spine, Jesus loves you. He wants to do miracles for you. He wants to make you fabulously wealthy. You know, he he's just your best friend. He wants to help you live your best life. I mean, who's going to throw somebody like that in prison? What? Okay, cool. I'll take that, Jesus. But the Jesus who will cast your behind into, into uh, you know, a lake of fire uh, because you didn't make him Lord, uh, you know, that, you know, calling out sin, uh, dealing with controversial, you know, quote-unquote controversial issues and bringing a scriptural light to them and not backing down. Um, again, you can do all that in love, but how dare you be passionate about that, right? I'm sorry. I just don't... Sorry. Sorry. Any squish Christians out there, quit being a squish, okay? You can speak the truth in love, right? Ephesians literally says to do that. Uh that does not mean don't speak the truth. Um, you know, we can, we can get into the minutia of the best ways, the best analogies to use, the best phrasing, uh, that kind of nonsense. But really what the problem is, is people don't want to actually be the light that the church is supposed to be because the light will offend when someone loves darkness. When someone is in their sin and they do not want to come to Christ, they do not want to make him Lord, they want to be Lord of their own life, um, that light is going to offend them. And so it's just the way it is. It's the nature of the beast, my friend. And uh, pun intended. And listen, listen, Edmund Burke, Edmund Burke, he said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Chilling effect. Self-censorship, afraid of what's going to happen, afraid of what people are going to say, well, afraid of what somebody's going to say. They're going to see the live stream, and they're going to, they're not going to like what's going on. That People are going to leave a nasty, they're going to thumbs down. They're going to leave a nasty comment. And, <laughs> uh, you know, they're, that that's the problem, though. People aren't going to like me. You're right. Yeah, yeah. If you're a real Christian and everybody likes you, you're not a real Christian. I, I'm sorry. Sorry. If the world likes you, you're not a real Christian. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, James said, the friendship of the world, the, to be friends with the world, you are the enemy of God. Sorry. Uh, Paul, Romans chapter 8. Same thing, right? You, you can't have it both ways. And so I have a portion of Scripture I want to go through here in Matthew 10 that really kind of hits home, and it, and it has to do with this. To me, you got the chilling effect, right? You're, you're, you're quiet. You're at school. You know you're how your teacher believes. You're not sure how your fellow students believe, maybe, and you don't want to say something. You know, listen, I've got an answer for this. Look, this is uh, Matthew 10, 16. We're going to read a portion of Scripture here together. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Remember that scripture? Wise as serpent, innocent as doves. 
Why should you be that way? Because you're you're a sheep in, in the midst of wolves. It, they're out there wanting to devour you. Like they're they're wolves. Okay. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts, flog you in their synagogues. You'll be dragged before governors, kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Bear witness before them? You mean sometimes when you're put in an awkward situation like that, that actually Jesus set that up so that you can bear witness to him, not so you can cower over in the corner and, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm a man of faith. Which faith? I love God. What God? <laughs> you know, again, it, maybe 50 years ago, no, nah, not probably not 50 years ago, maybe 60 or 70 or 80 years ago, if you said God, most people understood that to be Jesus, Christianity. But nowadays, what God? What faith? Um, you know, it, it's not the name of faith or the name of God that people hate. It's the name of Jesus. It's specifying what your belief system is. It's calling out the, 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 the way, the truth, and the life. And now they can't say, well, he said God, and I've got my God. Or he said faith, and whatever, I've got faith in science. No, now they know, oh, no, he's about Jesus. Uh, so now it just kind of boils it down to one road, which there is, one way, which there is, one door, which there is, one Savior, which there is. Um, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, right, according to Ephesians. Uh, <clears throat> So we're on to verse 19. We're in Matthew 10, 19. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you're to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Uh, brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father is child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. Whose name? Jesus' name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Uh, stop, okay? Let's just stop right now. Why Why would they throw you in prison? Why are they going to hate you? I mean, if you're just, hey, man, you can live your best life. Jesus loves you. He's crazy about you. He wants you to be wealthy. He wants you to be in heaven with him forever. Why would somebody hate that message? It's because of the real gospel, which is not that. The real gospel is repent, O wretched sinner, I am, you are, everybody, right? We, we, we are nothing but sinners. We must repent of our ways, meaning a lot of the things that I naturally or you naturally or whoever naturally might want to do, might desire, we have to say no to that. And the reason we say no to that is because Jesus is Lord and we obey him. Now that message in today's society, yeah, now I'm starting to see why people might hate you. Uh, verse 23, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now this is uh, back, I mentioned eschatology. Answer that one for me. The Son of Man is going to come. You will not have gone through all the towns of Israel. He's speaking to the, he's sending out his, his disciples, right? You're not going to go throughout all the towns before the Son of Man comes. We're like 2,000 years later, and that still hasn't happened? What? Right? What? What? No. <laughs> anyway, just that I'm not even talking about that. I just wanted to, it's just right there. I had, it's in my face. I had to comment on it. Verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Stop. Right? He's getting ready to make an analogy, but he's, he's making the point. Jesus is our master. Oh, he's the lover of my soul. He's the Rose of Sharon. He's the, you know, yes, he is. He is. You can be in a wonderful love relationship with Christ. Absolutely. But understand in that love relationship, right? He is the boss. He is Lord. He is master. Not we're co-equal in that and certainly not us. Okay. That is just so important because so many people get this false Christ that they absorb into the, into their theology, and then it messes their, their theology up. Um, anyway, so then he goes on and says, if they have called the master of the house Belzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So don't don't be surprised when they call you. I mean, they were calling him Belzebul, all right? Nobody is going to call you Belzebul, <laughs> okay? 
That's not a thing right now in Western culture. They're going to call you racist, homophobe, bigot, sexist, um, misogynist. Um, what are some of the other ones? I don't, and there's, there's, I'm sure there's others. That was only like five. There's got to be lots more. Um, you know, uh, heteronormative, uh, cisgender, you know, all these words that like people over 50 don't even know what in the world these ridiculous things even mean. <laughs> and more power to you for that. Um, but again, they're going to call you this stuff. Of course they are. Of course they are. Now, again, don't don't be a jerk. Like, don't be mean for mean sake. But like what I'm doing right now, right? You just call stuff out. It's That's what it is. And I'm not trying to be mean. I, I'm not trying to be nasty. But that's the word of God. So, again, we don't want to be mean for mean sake, hard for heart's sake. And, and even in the, when you call something out, it's a call to repentance. I have seen guys that seem to just like really like, like I say on like, you know, YouTube or whatever. They like the calling out part. But where is the, like, the echo back of like, Rah, repent, right? You're, you're in your sin, man. This is sin. This is evil. This is disgusting. This is, okay. And come on out of it. Jesus paid the price. You need to repent and come out of that, right? So there, it should be balanced. It should be the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel isn't one-sided, just all death, destruction, fire, and brimstone. And it's not all like live your best life, you know, healthy and wealthy. So then he goes on in verse 26, so have no fear of them. Oh, so, so don't be afraid. Go out there and preach, teach, say it, proclaim, right? Then he goes on, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Folks, that is a... Uh, <laughs> that is a threat. <laughs> Did you not catch that? that? That That's a threat. He's literally saying... These people can kill the body. So what? You die, and you're going to be forever with God, with Jesus, the Father, just basking, you know, with all the angels in glory, right? Um, but there is somebody who can kill you in this world <laughs> and send your behind, your soul behind, to hell. So he's saying that's who you should fear this lets us know we we have a reverence and a quote unquote a fear right we're not like a scaredy cat afraid of god but there is a reverence a holy fear of god and this is missing in a lot of churches and with a lot of christians it's missing and we need to get it back um because when we have that holy fear we don't we don't think we don't start thinking we have options of like not not proclaiming the gospel, of like not standing out with people, of like, you know, I just be over here doing my thing, got my church life over here, and then I got my secular life over here. No, we don't have that option. So verse 29, he says, again, we're in Matthew 10 still. Verse 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men... I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, I think we need to think about that a little more than just, you know, if I'm really put on the spot and somebody says, like, are you with Christ? Then I'll admit it. Because the... The flip side is the everyone who acknowledges me before men. This is, again, a testimony. This is out there before in front of people. Um, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. I want Jesus to acknowledge me. I need to acknowledge him. Not some ethereal, like, kind of watered-down um, concept of God, right? Because... I mean, that, that could be New Age, 
That could be any religion that has some kind of God. Uh, it doesn't have to be one, right? And that could be Hinduism, right? There's Eastern religions that actually have deities and gods, right? I know there's some that, you know, like Buddhism and stuff that don't really have a, a, a true deity, a real God. But there's lots that do have. And so what God are you talking about? It's Jesus Christ. He said, acknowledge me, Jesus. I think we need to be clearer in our language. I think when people pray in public, they need to pray in Jesus' name. I don't think, oh God, blah, 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 in your name. Who's the your? Who is the your? It's Jesus. Oh, I might get flack for that. He literally said, if you do not, <laughs> if you do not acknowledge me before men, right, I will not acknowledge you, right? Uh, whoever denies me before men, I'll deny you. If you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you. I, I think we need to acknowledge God. And if if we're in a, if we're in a if we're in a position where it's like, hey, we want you to do this public prayer, but you cannot close in the name of Jesus, then just say, well, I'm, then I'm not doing the prayer. Right? Then I'm not doing the prayer. Um simple as that. Then you then you're not caught in that situation where you might be denying Jesus Christ. For some, for what? Well, I want to I want to get out there and at least reach reach them with what? You're not even allowed to say what you are about, who you're even serving, what God. If I translated that as the God of this world, Satan, in your name, oh, the name of Satan. I mean, <laughs> we're talking about a specific God. He goes on to say, and this is some heavy stuff that Jesus. This is right here. I I just I'm saying this tongue in, tongue in cheek. Okay, right there in the red letters, man. <laughs> Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Wait, Jesus said that? Jesus said, I have not come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword? Ouch. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Wait, Jesus came to do that? Verse 37, whoever loves father or mother more than me, is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. See, this is additional clarification on some of the areas where it says, unless you hate father, father, mother, you know, son, daughter, all that stuff, you're not worthy of me. He's not saying like you literally should hate everybody or your closest family. He's saying your love for him should be higher. It should surpass your love for everybody else, even your closest relationships. Verse 39, whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Um, all right. I think I'll just end it right there. So again, I, I, I'm 34 through 39, just a really hard saying of Jesus that needs to get out there that people need to be aware of. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Um, whoa, because there's going to be conflict when he brings the kingdom of God and you got the kingdom of darkness, there is conflict. There is, uh, uh, heard a guy, uh, Jeff Arnold, um, one time, uh, preached on, well, I think he has a book and stuff on it too. I'm not really hundred percent sure, but I heard him one time talk about power encounter where you've got, um, there's a, there's a, there's the dominion of Satan and the dominion of, of Jesus Christ. Right. And then they're going to come into conflict and there's a boom, there's an encounter and there's conflict and there's head to head, boom, coming against each other. That's, that's the way it is. And so when we go out there, we're not looking to just be a jerk, be mean, um, but we should be looking for an opportunity to bring light to darkness. And guess what? Everybody in darkness isn't going to love it. Some will actually hate it. They will actually um, hate you. They will say mean things about you. They're going to call you Belzebul, <laughs> right? Okay, so they're obviously not Belzebul, but... Um, yeah, okay. Call me names. Whatever. Uh, I'm just out here trying to do right by my Lord and Savior and Master, Jesus Christ. Um, you take it up with him. And if people hate me because of Christ, because of they don't like the Word of God, what am I going to do? Right? I have two options, right? If if I want to get in with the good with that crowd, I have to compromise or I have to shut my mouth right back to the chilling effect so what is the effect what what is the issue that we've seen 
Christians for too long, for too you know too much, we have um, we have basically gone along with nonsense, uh, right? All this stuff that just happened. It was in the news recently about the Grammys and all that stuff. You know what? Christians should absolutely just tune it out. We're against this. All those jokers that uh, you know, um, Brandon Lake and Kirk Franklin and. Dante Bowie, the uh, you know, and then the people, which is you know, he's the main guy, I think, but you know, people from uh, Maverick City, you know, they go to these, they go to this thing, and there's a satanic uh, display, and then you know, and they get up, and I, I don't know the exact order, but I think the show happened, and then they got their award. They should have got up. I mean, they literally are doing a satanic display, like they dressed up like Satan. Okay, so this would have been. Just a brute fact, if they would have got up and been like, that was the most satanic thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Duh, that's what they were going for. Yeah, you know, Sam Smith and all that stuff, doing the act. I mean, of course, they're the world. They're darkness. Of course, they're going to do terrible, evil, vile things. And that's not the first time it's been done. Like, literally, you're just copycatting. You're not even doing anything new. Like, get some original material. <laughs> you're, you're bored, yawn. This has been done. You can't really do anymore because it's all been done. But from a Christian perspective, they should have got up there and preached the gospel. They should, there was a room full of pagans and sinners and evil people up in that place. And maybe some of them are just yearning for, is there more than this? Is there something else? Maybe there's only two of them. But when Dante Bowie gets up there and basically just, oh yeah, I'm grateful to be here. Hello, Brandon Lake. Grab the stinking microphone. Oh, I'm going to make a scene. Yeah, Jesus made a scene. I mean, seriously? Grab the microphone and be like, dude, what are y'all doing? This is this this is sick. This is satanic. You need to repent. There's a Jesus who loves you but and does not want you doing this stuff, but that Jesus is going to judge you and cast you into hellfire for eternity, and I care about you, and I can't leave here without saying something. Of course, he won't be invited back, and that's probably why these guys didn't say anything, because they want to be there on the stage. James said the friendship of the world is the enemy of God. When you're the friend of the world, you are God's enemy. Um, and again, I'm, I pray that these guys, you know what? They repent, and the next time they have a chance, they get out there and they they do it right. Because I'm not saying that I've perfectly... I, I'm human. I, you know, the pressure's on. I mean, you're in a room full of powerful people and you're going to just call them out. I'm not saying that's easy. I'm not, I'm not saying that I 100% know I would done differently. I, I think I would. Well, I, first of all, I'd never be at the Grammys, right? Uh, second, I'm never going to get a Grammy. <laughs> I'm not good enough to get a Grammy, right? So, but I'm just saying, I mean, I, I really do think if that were me, like in the mindset that I'm in right now, like the person who I am right now, I absolutely would, it would be hard, but yeah, give me the microphone. You, listen, Jesus loves you guys. This is the path to hell. I don't want you on that path. I mean, what? There's nothing like mean about that, but you think they would like it? Oh, no. And you definitely would not be invited back to the Grammys because that whole thing is nothing but a who's who and it's totally subjective and if they don't want you in, you're not going to be in. Um, but that's just the way it is. And so again, why, why, why am I bringing that up? It's the same thing. If you do not acknowledge me, I don't care. Look, and I, I sing some of these people's songs. Our worship team does some of their songs because we're not singing to Dante Bowie. We're not singing because we love Brandon Lake so much, because he's so theologically sound. It's because the words, the song glorifies God, and it's an amazing song, and so we sing it. Um, I can't help the fact that, you know, the author or the singer or whoever gets up on stage and has no spine when confronted with an opportunity to speak truth to power, right? <laughs> or, or acknowledge Christ in front of a room full of people who need him desperately. Again, when we're when they're at a church with 10,000 people, all who agree with them, then they're bold as lions, right? I'm as bold as a lion, right? Yeah, not when you're outnumbered. And they're, I mean, it's not like they're going to drag them out and burn them at the stake or anything, though, right? And it's not like their life's in danger. Um, but all it takes is that, that pressure of you might lose money, you might lose friends, you might lose prestige, uh, prestige from the world. Um, that's all it takes. And they do what? 
self-censor. Now, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt by saying that was the chilling effect and self-censorship. I assume that they know that was all evil and wrong. But maybe they don't. <laughs> I don't know. All right. I'm happy to. Brandon Lake, you want to come on the podcast? Come on. Come on. Dante Bowie, open invitation, Kirk Franklin, any of y'all. I'll be happy to backpedal everything I'm saying if I'm wrong about what I'm saying. Um, but again, right? I'm just, again, it, it certainly looked to me like you denied Christ before men. And he said, when you do that, I'm going to deny you. He didn't say you can't keep making music and singing songs. Didn't say that, right? Matthew 7, just a few chapters before this, talks about people who cast out demons and all kinds of miracles. Okay, that is not songwriting. That is miracles. And yet Jesus still said, I don't, I don't know, you get out of here. So, again, I don't think he's going to acknowledge people that can sit through a satanic display um, and say nothing. <laughs> I mean, whoa, I don't mean like, uh, you know, in my opinion, it was satanic. It that that's what they were going for. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, yeah. But culturally, listen, folks, this is why we're here in this culture. Christians are a bunch of squishes. No spine. No, I mean, it's terrible. How are we going to win the people in the world? Now, let's say one out of fifty people in the audience, they're hungry for God, hungry for more, haven't really heard the gospel. That was their chance, and nobody says anything, right? What about your job? What about in your family? What about, you know, wherever it is? Don't be a squish. Preach the gospel. You can do it in love. Look, what I just said, you're on your way to hell, and I love you, and I don't want you going there. I want you in Christ. I want you in blessing. I want you on Team Jesus. How is that? That's not mean at all. All, but it is something that somebody might hate you over. They don't want to change. Um, but we shouldn't be squishes. And we were squishes in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And now here we are and, you know, look, and we have TikTok. <laughs> I'm just, boom, mic drop. I, I, that's it. I mean, that's all you got to say. You know, we got gender ideology in school. We got teachers like literally getting kids and, you know, poisoning their minds intentionally and, you know, it, it, how do we get here? Because that joker should be run out of town. Like they should, you talk about the chilling effect. If somebody has, <laughs> they have a desire to like get trans your kids. They should be so afraid of the community that they're in because it's all a bunch of straight up. We love Jesus. We're not putting up with that kind of stuff. We're going to call you out. Now, again, we're not going to beat you up, but we are going to call you out, okay? We are going to come against this. That's the society we should live in. We should live in a society that looks like the inside of a Book of Acts church. Look how they handled stuff in the Book of Acts church, where there was sin, where there was problems, whatever. They handled stuff. They didn't, put, they didn't tolerate nonsense, but they were loving, and they, it was about God. It was about Jesus. It was about the kingdom, you know? Why can't a city be like that, or a state, or a nation? Um, they were at one time. And I think it's because of these different impacts. Again, the one I spent the most time on, the, the true chilling effect where people are self-censoring because of fear. The, the bad eschatology that's like, yeah, we're just going to hold on, and Jesus is going to be here, and it's all going to get rolled up. And then, yeah, man, living in Beulah land. Um or the, you know, people just, oh, I don't want to be mean. I, I just don't want to be a jerk. I just, you can speak truth in love. You can call out evil. You can preach the gospel in love. Of course you can. Uh, eschatologically, we can agree to disagree, my friend. Um, but we are, Jesus said, we're supposed to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. So, sorry, bud. We're supposed to have an impact in the earth as the church. And then third... All that fear and everything, there is no excuse. We must acknowledge Christ or he, and that's what makes him acknowledge us. If we deny him, he will deny us. So hopefully that was uh, helpful and um, give somebody some encouragement to get out there, be the light, 
preach the gospel, be love, absolutely, but be truth in equal measure. And um, I think that's the uh, that's the way we need to follow Jesus. That's the way we need to be disciples. And that's where I'm going to leave it right now. Don't let the chilling effect have an effect on you. Rather, let's turn this thing around. Okay? Let's be the church we're supposed to be, and let's watch the world around us change as we do in our individual lives, our families, our communities. We step out and we become the uh, thawed out on fire church of God, right? They were originally born in the fire. Let's keep that fire burning. Love you guys. God bless you. We will see you on the next podcast.